Zhang Feng used to say that the easiest people to teach are the ones who didn't know too much about the Dharma. Merchants from town would come out to the monastery. No background in the Dharma at all. And they were the easiest ones to teach. He'd say, do this, and they'd do that. And When they were further ready for the next step, then he'd tell them about the next step. And they didn't know about the next step beforehand. And so they didn't have a lot of preconceived notions about what should happen in their meditation. It was the ones who had read a lot who found that what they were reading often got in the way. Sometimes it was very high-level dharma they'd been reading about. And they'd sit and look at their minds where they were, and they, they weren't quite where the books said they should be. Either they'd get depressed, or else they'd start trying to squeeze their minds into the direction of where the book was, what they'd learned from the book, which is basically just perceptions based on ignorance. As John Lee once said, most people mistake low-level dharma for high-level dharma and high-level dharma for low-level dharma. And those who read about high-level dharma, well, all it is is just plain perceptions, labels. But when we look at our practice, we see that we're dealing with very simple greed, anger, and delusion. Anger about this person, frustration about this. Common, everyday defilements. And we don't want to have to deal with those. We want to go straight for the higher levels. Well, it's actually the, these immediate defilements in the present moment. That's high-level dharma. It's right what you've got to deal with right here, right now. That's the important work. As for the concepts you've developed from reading the books, leave that aside. Because it's not only abstract concepts we've picked up from books. Often we read the stories about the famous Ajahn's. And it sounds like they were on a straight path to nirvana. We have to realize that a lot of that is part of the genre. When you write about your teacher in Thailand, you don't talk about the difficulties they had. You don't talk about their backsliding. You don't talk about their frustrations. It's considered poor form. I found that out when I wrote a John Fung's biography for his when his body was placed in the mausoleum. And people were surprised that I put in some incidents that he'd told me about times when his practice hadn't gone well, when he had made mistakes. I thought they were inspiring, because seeing that he had made mistakes, I could look at my own mistakes and not get too flustered by them, realizing that we all make mistakes in the path, and learning about his mistakes and how he'd finally worked his way around that, I found that inspiring. The Thais were surprised that I included that. Some people actually thought I shouldn't have. So you have to realize when you're reading about the famous Ajahn that they considered poor form to talk about, you know, maybe years when there was frustration. But it's there. It's there in everybody's practice. The important thing is to Look at the frustration and look at the problems you're dealing with right here in the present moment. Realize this is high-level dharma right here, because this is what's there in the immediate present. This is the real thing. The stuff you picked up from books is concepts, and it's not yet real. And so what we have to do is, when unskillful mind states are arising, learn how to deal with them skillfully. I realize that it is possible. Sometimes it seems like the frustration is taking over the whole mind, and there doesn't seem to be the slightest room for any kind of skillful observer to get in there. That's not the case. If you look really carefully, you'll see that these mental states come and go, come and go, come and go. And you can watch. And sometimes that's all you have to do is just watch. Sometimes it's all you can do. You can't figure anything out. Well, you can always just watch. Always make sure that that observer is there. Because that's what keeps you in touch with what's actually going on. And John Lee once said that this is what the practice is all about, is seeing your defilements. If you don't see your defilements, if you turn a blind eye to them, then no matter what else you do in the practice, you're not really practicing. 
It's seeing these issues as they come up, watching them, observing them. Sometimes it takes a long time. But this is, after all, a practice that goes someplace. And even though there may be difficulties, and maybe backsliding, this is still a path with an open end, not like the closed-in paths of most people's lives. And John Mahabua tells a story of when he was out in the forest one time and feeling very frustrated about his meditation. And so happened it was a it was a holiday, and the people in the village were having a were playing some music and doing whatever else they did on the holiday, making a lot of noise. He could hear the noise way off in the distance. And at first he thought, here I am and miserable in the forest, just making myself miserable. Those people at least are having a good time. But then he came to his senses. Hey, wait a minute. Those, where, are they, where are they going in their lives? They're not going anywhere in particular. Where does where all that fun and games take them? It doesn't take them anywhere. At least the meditation leaves a door open. And whether it's going well or not going well, the door is there. It's open. It's interesting that there's almost an, the identical story as in the, in the Pali Canon of a monk who overhears the music coming from a village one night on a, on a holiday night and starts feeling miserable about himself. At least they're having, they know how to have fun. Here I am just making myself miserable in the forest. And this Deva comes and appears to him, and she says, you don't know how many people envy you. Their lives are totally hemmed in. And they're heading down to hell many times. So realize that you're on a path that goes someplace. And even though it may seem to be muddling around, you're dealing with the real issues right here, right now. And that's what's important. They may not seem to be the most inspiring issues. They may not seem to be the issues that you want to deal with, but they're the ones that are here. They're the ones that offer themselves to you so you can observe them. This is where the real Dharma is learned. It's in the present moment. Where do you think the Buddha learned the, the Dharma? He didn't have books to go by. He just had his ability to observe what was happening in the present moment. And if it took a long time to observe it, well, he just stuck with it. Not that it was easy. But by watching these things, you have the opportunity to understand them. And when you can understand them, when you comprehend them, you can go beyond them. If you don't watch them, if you distract yourself with all kinds of other things, the real job never gets done. It's our ability to see what the mind is doing to cause itself suffering. That's where the real Dharma lies. That's the first noble truth right there, combined with the second noble truth. And if you don't look at that, there's no way that the third and fourth noble truths can do their work. So whatever gets served up in the present moment, think this is the high-level Dharma for right now. This is the actuality. This is the genuine thing right here. What we read about in books is just stories. There's the John Fu told the story of a John Mun when he was visited by monks who'd gotten their degrees in Pali studies, and very proud of the fact that they had read all the way through the Vasudhimagga. Each of the Vasudhimagga has basically three main sections. There's the Sila Nidesa, the Samati Nidesa, and the Banya Nidesa. Nidesa basically means section or chapter. In Thai it was Nitaid. So John Man said, what do you have in the Vasudhimagga? Where there's the Sila Nitaid? What does Nitaid mean? It means Nitan in Thai, which means fables, stories. Just words about those high-level dharmas. The real thing, he said, is in your mind right here, right now. Either it's there or it's not. The potential for virtue, the potential for concentration, the potential for discernment are all there. But it's not the case that you go straight to those things without having to muck around with all your defilements, because they're going to get in the way one way or another. Because our habit is to deal unskillfully with whatever comes up. The results of skillful actions are nice, so we tend to get complacent an unskillful reaction to something that was originally skillful. Or when things get bad, then we just pile more unskillfulness on top of it, what they call positive feedback loops, positive in the sense that it just strengthens what's already there. And this is our problem. We tend to approach skillful, the results of skillful action with a negative feedback loop. We can only get so skillful, and then we pull it back down. 
but it seems to be very easy to approach the unskillful things with positive feedback loops, just keep pulling things further and further and further down. This seems to be a, a habit with us, but it can be unlearned. And the only way you can unlearn things is watch. Watch and then watch again, watch again, and bit by bit by bit. It may not be as fast or as convenient as you'd like to be, but this is the, the only way out. Deal with what comes up in the present moment. But it's not the case that it's always hard. There are, there are pleasant stretches as well, good stretches. But when you're stuck in a, in a difficult stretch, that seems to be there all there is. But that's not the case. Look around and see how many things you're not burdened with right now. I remember the first time I ordained and disrobed. Immediately after disrobing, there was a sense of weightlessness. I felt like I'd been freed from this huge burden of having to gain awakening. And for a while it did feel like freedom, but then I began to realize this is like being in an elevator that's where the cord is suddenly cut, the cable has been cut, and there's a moment of weightlessness, and then you hit the ground. You suddenly realize you've got to go out and you've got to make a living. You've got to deal with the people in ways. and not being treated with the same respect you were before, and all these other things come crowding in, crowding in, crowding in, and lay life suddenly feels very, very narrow and very confined, as they say in the text. So learn to have an appreciation of what's not weighing you down. The Buddha calls that alighting on emptiness. In other words, realizing, okay, what disturbances are here, but what disturbances are not here. You don't add any on to what's naturally here. And you have a sense of the space, the emptiness around the disturbances that are weighing your mind down. And you realize there is a lot of space there that you are not appreciating. So take heart. The path is a good path, even though it may seem frustrating. It's a path that goes someplace. Otherwise we just wander around aimlessly, as the Buddha said. It's like throwing a stick up in the air. Sometimes this end comes down, hits the ground. Sometimes the other end hits the ground. Sometimes it comes down splat in the middle. There's no real rhyme or reason to it. There's no pattern to it at all. The ups and downs of this wandering around goes nowhere. But the noble path is one that does go someplace. That's the whole point. So whether it's easy or difficult, that's not the issue. The issue is you're at least you're on a path that's going someplace, it's going to the end of suffering. It's going to true freedom. As the Buddha said, if you could get a guarantee that if by submitting to a being stabbed with spears a hundred times in the morning, a hundred times at noon, a hundred times in the evening for a hundred years, day in, day out, day in, day out, every day, but guaranteed that you would gain awakening at the end of that time. He said it would be a good deal. And when the awakening did come, he said you would not regard that you had won that awakening through pain or suffering. The awakening would have totally blotted out any sense, sense of pain. It would have been much more than worth it. So here we are, stabbing ourselves with metal spears. But we don't have to. We don't have to add suffering on top to the whatever unskillful states are already there. Just learn to watch and watch again, watch again, and learn to be comfortable with the fact that you have the time and you have the space and the opportunity to watch. So many people don't even have that opportunity at all, and they spend their times instead painting pictures about what high-level dharma they've attained or going to attain or whatever. But it's just all pictures. Here you're grappling with a real thing. And that's what the Dharma is. It's the real thing. So you've got everything you need right here. And whether it's the lesson you want to be learning now, right now, that's not the issue. It's the lesson that's presenting itself to be learned. And obviously it's a lesson you need to learn or else it wouldn't be there. And you've got the time and the opportunity. And through the drama, you've got the guidance on how to work your way through. And whether it's fast or slow, that's not the issue. The fact that you're, you're working with it, that's what matters.